Hi everyone, I'm Zico Coulter. I'm with Carnegie Mellon and the Bosch Center for AI. And I'm David Duvino, and I'm at the University of Toronto and the Vector Institute. And I'm Matt Johnson from Google Brain. All right, and we're gonna to talk today about deep implicit layers, neural ODEs, equilibrium models, and beyond. So to start off, um, we're gonna ask the question, you know, what do we wanna do with deep learning? So if you're using deep learning, you're probably thinking about some of like the classical applications of deep learning. So there are things like image classification, semantic segmentation, language modeling, generative models. These are domains where there have been sort of major breakthroughs that have happened due to deep learning. And we all sort of are very aware of some of the impressive progress these fields have made. But there also are a lot of emerging applications, things like continuous modeling, continuous time systems, uh, smooth density estimation, or solving constrained optimization problems. These are problems that a lot of existing methods in deep learning are not that good at. And so what we're going to talk about today is a framework which actually enables you to solve basically all these problems and do so very well. And that's the framework of implicit layers. So to start off with, what is a layer? For the purposes of this tutorial, a layer is going to be a differentiable parametric function. And the way that we typically construct deep learning architectures is we hook a bunch of these things together. And these layers can be things, of course, simple things like linear layers or convolutions, ReLUs, or more complex things like LSTM cells. But we hook these all together and then train the whole system end to end via backpropagation. However, there actually are different types of layers here, and there's a distinction that we're going to make a lot in this tutorial, and that is between explicit and implicit layers. So almost all the layers that you typically use in deep learning are actually what are called explicit layers. And what that means is they provide a concrete computation graph for how we compute the output from the input. And in fact, this is so kind of common that it almost you can't really imagine anything but this for a layer in many cases. But what we're going to show you today is there's actually a very different kind of, kind of layer you can use, which enables a lot of really cool things. And these are called implicit layers. And the big idea here is that instead of specifying directly a computation graph and then backpropping through it to, to give you the output from the input, implicit layers define some condition that the output and input should jointly satisfy. So for example, the output and input could jointly satisfy some nonlinear equation. And there are many examples of this, including things like differential equations, fixed point iteration, optimization, et cetera, and we'll talk about a lot of these. So why would you want to use implicit layers, though? Well, what it comes down to are a few, uh, there actually are many reasons, um, but the first one is that they have very powerful representation. So you can compactly represent very powerful functions that are hard to represent with a single uh, explicit computation graph in a single layer, at least with a simple single layer. The next one, though, is uh, about memory efficiency. So as we'll see, actually pretty extensively in this tutorial, a nice benefit of implicit layers is that you can actually analytically differentiate through the fixed point without needing to unroll them. They're also, in some sense, very simple in that often the element you have to specify for very complex operations winds up being a relatively simple cell, a relatively simple parameterization of the layer. And finally, these layers have a nice abstraction property. In other words, they separate out what a layer should do, what task it's trying to accomplish, from, in some sense, how you compute that. This is an abstraction that's worked well in many other settings, things like complex optimization, uh, differential equation solving, etc. And it's very nice to bring this to the setting of deep learning. So coming back to sort of what we want to do with deep learning, what we'll actually show is that you can basically do all these things with implicit layers as well. So for example, a lot of classic machine learning tasks and deep learning tasks can be accomplished using a method called deep equilibrium models. Um, Things like flexible generative models, smooth density estimation, and continuous time modeling fit very well into the framework of neural ODEs and flow-based models. And similarly, things like solving constrained optimization fit very well into the framework of differentiable optimization. So in this tutorial, the goal is to provide you with an understanding of the techniques, motivations, and applications for implicit layers in modern deep learning. 
there's going to be a heavy focus on kind of the mathematical foundations of these implicit layers, as well as how you do automatic differentiation through them. We'll even see some code on how to do that. We'll highlight a lot of examples, including neural ODEs, the equilibrium models, and differential optimization. And we'll, as I said, we'll have some starter code and highlights for future directions. Now, one point I want to make is that there's a detailed set of both notes and code available at our companion website, which you should definitely check out. It's going to be implicitlayerstutorial.org. All right, so with that being said, let's jump in and talk about implicit layers. The basic outline here is that we're going to first uh, give a bit of background and talk about some of the applications of implicit layers. Then we'll talk about the mathematics of implicit layers. We'll talk about deep equilibrium models, neural ODEs, and differentiable optimization as three applications or instantiations of implicit layers. And finally, we'll end with some teacher directions. All right, so let's jump right in first to some background. I'm going to start with this background, and then David will take over to discuss additional background and additional applications of implicit layers. All right, so to start off with, the first thing we want to highlight here is clarify maybe a myth that some people might have, which is the implicit layers, the myth that is, is that implicit layers are new to neural networks. Uh, in reality, actually, implicit layers go back very far in deep learning to the late 80s, uh, highlighted by the papers of Pineda and Almeida, uh, which go under the name of recurrent backpropagation. And actually, these are, uh, are, are, are uh, copies from these two papers here. And one very cool thing to note is that this is, again, in 1987. And what you had, for example, was you had layers that used differential equations. Or you had layers that were fixed point equations. These did largely fall out of favor, uh, uh, in favor of explicit network structure. But really, a lot of the current efforts that we're going to talk about today are efforts at revisiting these ideas, but using, importantly, the tools and techniques of modern architectures as well as modern automatic differentiation tools. I should highlight, though, that the work did not disappear entirely. There was some work in the 90s and 2000s on these layers. So I want to highlight a few of these examples here. Um, there was some work in the 90s on using implicit models as essentially unrolling uh, Runge-Kutta integration for differential equations, including some applications to very interesting things like carbon monoxide crystallization. Um, however, for the most part, as I mentioned before, these layers kind of did fall out of, of favor uh, until sort of more recent times. So I want to highlight some of the things that came about now um, that sort of spawned reinterest in these implicit layers. And one of these areas was the topic of differentiable optimization. So starting in the late 2000s, a lot of groups started working with differentiable variants of optimization problems. So for example, uh, Stephen Gould in 2016, as well as his collaborators, and then later followed on by their work in deep declarative networks, formulated layers as often non-convex optimization problems. Um, Matt Johnson, actually here, who I'm speaking for now, uh, did some work on, structural on the structural variational autoencoder, which differentiated through graphical model inference formulated as an optimization problem. Um, some of my own work uh, in this field, really done mainly by my student, my uh, former student Brandon Amos, looked at differentiating uh, quadratic programming problems as layers in deep networks. And then finally, more recently, um, uh, Brandon as well as some collaborators worked on integrating this uh, with the CVX-PI framework. And really, Achay Agarwal, as well as Stephen Diamond at Stanford, led the effort on getting a very uh, tightly integrated package that wraps the CVX-PI uh, tool, which is also developed by, by Stephen Diamond and Stephen Boyd, into these automatic differentiation frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow. There's also been work on alternative optimization techniques. So there was some work on a framework called SatNet, which differentiated through a smooth version of the max sat problem uh, using a differentiable variant of semi-definite programming. There's also been work on submodular optimization, differentiable submodular optimization, which is used uh, for many things, but amongst them uh, for optimizing graph cuts. And then finally, another t uh, the, the, the last topic I'm going to mention here, um, but which is one that we'll come back to later, is the framework of deep equilibrium models. 
which tries to essentially use a fixed point iteration to fold an entire deep network up into a single uh, implicit layer, or I guess a single implicit layer that works more like a, a traditional cell in a deep learning network. And this often gets state-of-the-art performance or matches state-of-the-art performance uh, with equivalent parameter counts uh, and, tr and, and training methods on a variety of domains, including NLP domains, uh, vision tasks, etc. Now I'll hand it over to David to talk about some of the background and applications in neural ODEs. All right, thank you very much, Zico. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about ordinary differential equations and how solving them can be seen as an implicit layer. To be precise, if we take a vector z and we say it follows dynamics f, and we know its initial position, then we can define the solution of an ODE to be the path that follows this gradient to some final time t1. If we define the output, or rather the uh, of a layer as the output at this future time, uh, we can say this is a uh, function where we've defined what we want to compute, but not exactly how to compute this intractable integral. Neural ODEs can be used pretty much anywhere where you could use a ResNet in a larger deep learning framework. Um, so specifically, uh, if we were using a neural ODE as a classifier, then we would hope that the data at the end of the time evolution of the ODE would be more easily separable than at the beginning. We can see an animation of this where a neural ODE has learned a vector field that separates two concentric circles of data into linearly separable clusters. Continuous time models are one of the most natural applications afforded by ordinary differential equations. Specifically, often we're modeling systems where we know something about the dynamics that they follow, perhaps that they follow a, um, they're constrained by, by a Hamiltonian or Lagrangian. And if we enforce this structure into either the dynamics of a molecular simulation or into a free-form dynamics model that we're learning, we can do things like enforce conservation of energy while we're training our models. Another area where continuous time models uh, help us build more flexible models is in continuous normalizing flows. So this is a family of parametric density models that works by starting with a simple base density like a Gaussian and then defining a continuous transformation into some more complex parametric density. And it turns out that the change of variables formula is easier to compute in continuous time than in discrete time. Just in the last few months, this approach uh, has been scaled up to 1,000 by 24 by 1,000 by 24 images using an alternate training method. Um, and unlike GANs, these approaches provide a uh, well-defined density that can be computed, which lets us do things like in painting, given a certain part of an image, we can sample from the distribution over the rest of the pixels. Uh, a special case of this is image colorization. And the point is, unlike other large image models, uh, once we've trained our density, we can answer all of these different queries without retraining at all. Um, another place where we can use continuous normalizing flows is in parameterizing homeomorphisms, which might sound exotic, but it actually just means, an, well, its most natural use is to define a non-self-intersecting shape, such as when we're building a 3D model. Um, it also turns out to be easy to def easier to define density models on exotic surfaces, such as manifolds, uh, by converting them into continuous time flows. So for example, a recent paper by Mathieu and Nickel um, shows how we can build continuous normalizing flows on spheres and other exotic manifolds. There's also applications to biology where we might want to interpolate between the density of, say, cellular, cellular dynamics or in um, colonoscopy, where we want to build a convolutional neural network, but we're not sure how many layers of convolution we need. Um, the adaptive computation of ODE solutions allows us to automatically adapt the effective number of layers in our convolutions. Probably the most natural application of continuous time models is in modeling irregularly sampled data of the kind that you would find when you're modeling, say, health outcomes or uh, business data, where the data comes, it's measured at irregular intervals. And finally, there are other uses of the implicit gradients that we're going to be using to train all these models. Um, in particular, we can use them for gradient-based hyperparameter optimization, which lets us optimize millions of hyperparameters. It's also um, has been applied in meta-learning. All right. 
So now I'm going to hand this over to Matt, who's going to tell us about the mathematics of implicit layers. All right. Hi again, everyone. So actually, before Matt takes the reins here, um, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about the motivation uh, of a simple model that we might want to use um, for implicit differentiation and as an implicit layer. So the way that we're going to motivate this is thinking about kind of traditional deep network. So typically, a deep network is some transformation of the input where you keep applying you know, a weight matrix, maybe you add a bias, and then you apply nonlinearity. Right? So the next layer is always this nonlinearity applied to a linear function of the previous layer. And to motivate the use of implicit layers, we're actually going to make a little modification to this network. Uh, we're going to make two modifications, in fact. We're going to first, at every step, rather than just adding a bias, we're going to re-inject the input. Uh, and actually, you can add a bias too. You can always add an extra bias to the input. But for now, we'll think about just always adding the input again. In addition, we're also going to use the same weight at each layer of the network. In other words, this is called a weight-tied network. Now, this might seem like a very big uh, special case or a very big imposition we're putting on our network here. But it turns out, actually, weight tying across depth is very common in deep learning. A lot of architectures are doing this now anyway as a means of regularization. And in practice, you can even actually show theoretically, which we'll get to in a little bit later, that this is not that big a restriction. It's a very simple proof, of course, but it isn't actually that big a restriction. So when we do this now, something very interesting happens. So in particular, because we are repeatedly applying the exact same function repeatedly to the hidden units, right? We have the same weight, the same input injection. We can view this system as a dynamical system, right? Where the, the hidden vector z is acting kind of like a state of the system, and it's evolving with repeated applications. And in fact, in many such situations, we can design the network in a way such that the network will converge, the, the hidden state z will converge to some fixed point or equilibrium point, which we call z star. In other words, this is a point where if we apply the function again, it remains unchanged. This is precisely, actually, a recurrent back propagation network or a very simple and minimal uh, deep equilibrium model. And it's set up just with a fixed point iteration. And this is how we actually go about computing this layer. The question, of course, is how do we get into the details and actually do things like compute the fixed point and differentiate through it? So to answer that, we're going to consider a very simple example where we actually think about this being a specific nonlinearity, like the tan h function. And so the question is, how do we compute this fixed point to begin with? Do we have to iterate, or are there other ways of doing it? And then how do we integrate? And if we do compute this fixed point, how can we integrate a layer like this within backprop, within automatic differentiation? Does the derivative of this fixed point even exist with respect to the weights or the input x? And so to answer this, we're going to start with a quick demo. And I'm going to hand it over to Matt to both show us some cool code and then take us through the math about why this point in fact exists. Thanks, Zico. Great, so now that we've seen a simple example of what a deep equilibrium model can look like in math, let's take a look at how we might implement this in code. Um, so we're gonna be using JAX for this demo, but you know the same ideas can be instantiated in PyTorch or, or TensorFlow as well. Um, great, so let's start by just uh, importing uh, JAX, and then let's write a little uh, fixed point layer. Um, so this, this will just be a function, um, and it takes four arguments. It's going to take a fixed point solver. So we're going to parameterize you know, how we compute the fixed point. It's going to take a function f, which is the function uh, that we want to find the fixed point for. It's going to take some parameters. So this is where the weights will come in, and it'll take a, an input x. Um, so given our fixed point layer, the way it proceeds is it calls the solver uh, to compute a fixed point of this parameterized function f, um, and we'll just initialize uh, always at, at 0. And then we'll return that, that fixed point. Great, so let's run that. Um, now that we have our sort of fixed point layer, let's just write a couple solvers that we might be able to use to find this fixed point. So maybe the most straightforward uh, solver 
is what's known as sort of a naive forward iteration. And the idea is just we're going to keep applying the function f and, until we uh, you know, find that it's not changing anymore. And then we'll say you know, we found a numerical fixed point, at least up to some tolerance. Um, so that's you know, a decent way to find fixed points. Um, maybe another slightly more sophisticated method would be to use a Newton iteration to find a fixed point. Um, and so this uses some uh, you know, derivative information of f uh, to take a more intelligent step and to try to find the fixed point more quickly with a bit more computation. So with that, we'll just have those two different solving routines. And this is just showing how implicit layers separate out uh, what gets computed, which is the fixed point, from how we compute it, which is the, uh, you know, some solving algorithm. And here we have two. Um, great, so we've got our layer. We've got a couple solving routines. Uh, let's try running this thing on a, on a simple example. So we'll generate some uh, random uh, data and a random input just to study the layer in isolation. And then we'll define uh, a layer like Zico told us about with a tanh nonlinearity and a, and a matrix vector multiply. And then we'll just try applying our fixed point layer uh, to see what we get. Uh, and indeed, this is the fixed point that we've that we found uh, by running the layer. Um, great, so that was using the forward solver. We can also try running the layer with our Newton solver. And up to you know, numerical tolerances, we're getting the same fixed point out. So this is showing how we're, we've decoupled what gets computed from exactly what fixed point solver we're using. Great, so maybe you know, one high level takeaway is that um, we can already differentiate through uh, this process. So using autodiff tools like JAX, we can just differentiate through all these iterations of our layer. So here, we're going to use JAX.grad to compute a gradient with respect to our weight matrix uh, of just this layer on its own, just the sum of the outputs of, of the layer. Um, and if we do that, we can see you know, we get a gradient value out. Um, this, in general, will be the you know, shape of the weight matrix W. And so I'm just printing the first row. So instead of a 10 by 10 matrix, we're just looking at the first row. Um, great. So that was looking at the gradient for the uh, fixed point layer using our forward iteration solver. If we use the Newton solver, uh, things work as well. And again, up to numerical tolerances, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what solver we use, we're computing the same function, and so we're also getting the same gradient. Um, and just to show you that you know, this isn't uh, uh, too restricted, we can even do things like second order uh, automatic differentiation. So here we can compute the Hessian of our layer as a function of its input x. Um, and this will be a uh, uh, you know a big matrix, so we'll just print out a, a chunk of it. But you know we're able to differentiate through this this uh, this layer that we've defined just fine. So you might wonder why uh, you know where where's the room for improvement? We can already differentiate through these layers. Uh, uh, what's more to say? So the issue is that if we just differentiate through the iterations of our solver, um, things are going to be inefficient, and we're not going to be able to get the benefits um, that Zico and, and David have talked about. Um, so to give some kind of a visualization of why that happens, um, we added some simple demo utility functions to help us visualize what's going on. Um, so in particular, we have this grad graph function, and that's going to sort of show us the graph that JAX is building to do reverse mode automatic differentiation of this function. And if we run this, we'll see that you know, we got some graph out. It's actually quite long, right? So this is a, a big graph. And the reason it's big is that um, we've differentiated through all the iterations of our solver. So there's like a lot of operations happening in this one tiny layer. So in particular, the, the sort of small blue nodes here are operations, and the yellow nodes are, uh, they represent stored memory, so saved values that we need um, from the forward pass of our computation. Uh, we're saving them so we can consume them on the backward pass. And really, that's the main inefficiency that's going to be really painful here. So with all these yellow nodes in this graph, that's telling us that we're saving a lot of memory, we're storing a lot of memory, and that means that uh, this layer is going to be very expensive to differentiate through can take a lot of memory. Um, so we're not realizing one of those big benefits of uh, implicit layers yet. So that was the, the graph for the just naive forward iteration. We can also produce the graph if we use a, a Newton solver. Again, this is just differentiating naively through the iterations of the solver. And we can see that the graph is different because we're running a different solver. We're running different operations. Um, but still, you know, this is a large unrolled graph, even on this small toy example. 
And all these yellow nodes are indicating that we're saving uh, a ton of values to be consumed on the backward pass of autodiff. That's going to be very expensive. Um, so just one more illustration, one more utility to sort of uh, emphasize the point of how wasteful we're being with memory when we differentiate through these iterations naively. Um, this is a little function that computes the memory ratio of how expensive it is just to evaluate the layer, just sort of the, uh, the forward evaluation inference in the layer. Um, and we're saying, <clears throat> compare that to how much uh, memory is needed to do reverse mode differentiation through it. And what this is telling us is that it's estimating it's about 70 times more expensive in memory to do uh, reverse mode differentiation and therefore to train this layer. So this is going to be really expensive. On this toy example, uh, you know, it's already expensive. But for realistic examples, this would just be untenable. Um, so we need to do something smarter uh, than differentiate through these things naively. So I focused on memory usage, but there's some other disadvantages here as well. If we just naively differentiate through the iterations of, of a solver, um, it could be that things are more numerically unstable, or we could even be uh, doing more floating point operations than, than would be optimal. So, you know, memory is the, the really big loss, but really we're sort of losing on all fronts when we differentiate naively. So we need to do something smarter, and to work out something smarter to do, we need to turn to math. Um, so let's switch over and take a look at uh, the math we can do uh, to, to sort this out and, and get some benefits from our implicit layer. So to start off with, I'm going to just review some basic derivative notation that we'll be using in this section, starting with just uh, what kind of functions you know, we'll be thinking about. So we'll be thinking about functions on uh, you know, real domains and real uh, codomains. So in general, if we have a, a function from Rn to Rm, here's a simple illustration on the right. Uh, of the graph of this function, um, where n equals m equals 1. How do we write derivatives? So in this section of the talk, we're going to write um, derivatives in this way. We're going to write this uh, sort of partial f, or the derivative of f, at a point x. That itself we can think of as a linear function from a copy of the input space to a copy of the output space, so from rn to rm. So if you like this, uh, this function, uh, the derivative of f evaluated at x is telling us how to map from small perturbations of the input uh, x to small perturbations on the output value of f. Um, so in general, though, we can also think about this uh, as a matrix. Um, and for the purpose of this tutorial, we're going to be focusing on thinking of this thing as a, as a matrix. So in general, this uh, Jacobian matrix will be, in this case, an m by n matrix. And it's basically just representing that, that linear map. So this is the notation we'll be using for differentiation. One other thing to underscore about our derivative notation, um, when we have functions of multiple arguments, we'll just use subscripts to indicate if we only want to differentiate with respect to one of those arguments. So in particular, we'll use this uh, partial sub 0 of f to indicate we're differentiating f with respect to the first positional argument, the one at index 0. Uh, holding the other arguments constant. And similarly, we'll use partial sub 1 to indicate we're differentiating with respect to f's second argument. Great, so that's it for differentiation notation. Now, the way we're going to solve our uh, differentiation efficiency problem is based on the implicit function theorem. So this, is, this theorem has a long uh, history, um, and this is the version of it that, that we're looking at, but it's really actually a, quite a deep uh, uh, idea in mathematics. So to start off with, let's just look at what the assumptions of the theorem are. Um, so <clears throat> we say we're going to look at an, a function f that takes in two arguments, one in rp and one in rn, and gives us a value in rn. So I like to think of this as sort of representing a parameterized system of nonlinear equations. So we think of the first argument, the one in rp, as some parameter. And then uh, we think of having n scalar uh, variables in our system of equations. Great, so let's look at uh, an example of that. Here is a very simple example where we just have p equals n equals 1 as the dimensions. And here we're plotting, um, uh, you know, so f is a function on z and a on, the, on this 2D plane here. And now we're just plotting where this function is equal to 0 in blue here. Um, so we're going to be focused on, on things like, like this. Great, so um, 
the hypothesis, uh, the hypotheses of the theorem are that you know consider a point at which this uh, function attains a zero. So we've got an a naught and a z naught, and that's a particular solution point. So we'll draw it here on the on the circle. Um, great. And then we're also going to assume that f is somehow nice, right? That it's continuously differentiable, and that it has a non-singular uh, Jacobian with respect with respect to its second argument, at least at this point that we're focused on. Um, great. So that's the setup. Doesn't seem too bad so far. Uh, what does this theorem tell us if we if we have this setup? So to start reading this, um, you know, this first part is saying there exist open sets that are around our uh, sort of operating point a naught z naught. Um, so in the figure, we're just sort of zooming in on uh, this rectangular region here. These open sets are basically saying there's some open interval uh, uh, for the values of a and some open interval for the values of z that we're going to zoom in on and, and focus on that contain our, our operating point. Um, great, so that's our uh, that's sort of a, a region we're going to zoom in on. And then the theorem tells us that there exists a uh, function that we're calling z star um, that is essentially a solution mapping. So as a function of the value of a, as a function of the parameters, uh, this solution mapping is going to be able to spit out uh, variables z that solve our equation, that uh, you know, set things up so that f of a and z star of a is always equal to zero for all values of a in the small region that we're focused on. So on the figure, we can see that this is basically saying that at least in this small uh, region that we're zoomed in on, we have this purple function that's giving us the value of z as a function of a. And it's going to be tracing out the sort of uh, solution locus of f for us. Great, and then moreover, it's also telling us that this function z star is differentiable uh, in this little zoomed in region. So at least very locally around a naught z naught, it's a differentiable function. Um, and that's really the, the main content of the implicit function theorem. It's saying that we can, as long as f is, is uh, somewhat nice, it's telling us that we can think of not just having one particular solution uh, for a given parameter a naught, but actually we can have a solution mapping function uh, at least locally around the solution. Great, so just to understand a little bit about when this, this uh, might be violated, when this might not hold, um, here's another point that we could have chosen as our a naught z naught pair. Um, you might ask yourself, you know, does, does this satisfy the theorem? Do we know that there is such a z star uh, function here? Um, and in fact, it doesn't apply here. And if you check, it's because of this other uh, condition that demands that we have a non-singular uh, Jacobian. In this case, if you work out the Jacobian of the formula on the top right of the slide, um, it's just you know a, a scalar, and it'll be zero at this point. And that's basically just telling us that um, we can't have such a, a local function z star because it wouldn't pass the vertical line test, uh, right? It wouldn't. There wouldn't be a unique value, a unique solution value for every different input a that we give it because uh, of the sort of vertical tangent line to the circle at this point. So. But as long as we avoid that kind of a pathology and we, you know, satisfy the, the sort of continuity and differentiability hypotheses, the implicit function theorem is telling us something really powerful. And we're going to be able to use that to do efficient automatic differentiation. So just a sort of quick aside here, um, I mentioned that the implicit function theorem is, is uh, quite deep and powerful. Um, it turns out there's this wonderful uh, book all about the implicit function theorem. Um, that talks about some connections that it has to, to different areas of mathematics. And you may notice that for this section, we're focused on things that look like solving nonlinear equations or, or fixed points or this kind of thing. Um, and we're not talking, at least overtly, about uh, neural ODEs and ordinary differential equations. Um, but it turns out that actually the implicit function theorem is quite strongly related to uh, ordinary differential equations. In particular, in particular, you can use it to prove uh, sort of the existence and uniqueness of certain ODE solutions, and even vice versa. You can prove the implicit function theorem using uh, uh, theorems about ODE uh, solution existence. So uh, it's really a, a, a fantastic thing to dive into. Okay, so back to um, sort of nonlinear equation solving and the implicit function theorem. So all we've worked out so far, this thing is telling us that there exists the solution mapping function z star, and that's going to be able to give us a solution um, for any sort of parameters that we plug in that are close to our nominal parameters, a naught. Um, however, we haven't sort of worked out any formulas for differentiation. 
Um, it turns out that once we know that this function exists, uh, it's sort of easy to derive uh, what um, the derivative of z star must be, what the Jacobian of this z star solution mapping must be. Um, so let's walk through that. So again, what's powerful about this first line here is that um, this is true for all values of a. So this is basically saying, actually, on both sides of this equation, um, we have functions of a. For all values of a, uh, the left side is equal to the right side. Um, so that means we can differentiate both sides of this equation as functions of a. Um, so let's do that. We just apply the chain rule. Um, we have here on this line sort of two terms from differentiating f uh, with respect to a. Um, the first term is sort of the direct effect that uh, nudging a has on the value of, of f because it's an argument uh, to f. And the second term is this sort of indirect effect because if we nudge a, that nudges the value of z star, our solution, and then that in turn changes the value of, of f. Um, so that's just you know the chain rule. Uh, we still have this holds true for all values of a in our uh, zoomed in region, but we can, if we want to just focus on you know this particular solution point, we can just plug in um, the particular value of a naught, and then we have this simpler equation here um, that just deals with sort of uh, concrete matrices f, uh, you know the derivatives of f evaluated at our solution point a naught z naught. So now we see that we actually have this um, Jacobian of z star. So this is telling us, uh, you know, how does the um, how do we differentiate through this solution mapping uh, function? We've got it right here. We've sort of got our hands on it. And if we just rearrange uh, this expression, um, this equation, using the fact that these are just matrices, we can in fact isolate uh, this um, uh, this Jacobian for z star that we're after. And so we can see. Again, how we're how we're relying on that uh, uh, partial one of f, that Jacobian at the point a naught z naught being non-singular because we're inverting it here. Um, but otherwise, this is just giving us an expression for uh, the Jacobian of the solution mapping. So just to zoom out about what this math is telling us, it's telling us that we can express, uh, you know, we can differentiate the solution of this uh, system of nonlinear equations, the solution mapping function. Uh, we can differentiate with respect to the parameters uh, just by evaluating derivatives of f at our solution point, our solution pair a naught z naught. So that's really that's really powerful. All right, that was all about sort of nonlinear systems of equations. Let's look at um, uh, the fixed point case that we were looking at in the in the code. So if we want to differentiate fixed point solution mappings rather than sort of uh, systems of nonlinear equations, things are very simple. The only uh, difference is that instead of saying f uh, at z naught a naught is zero, we're just going to say that that is giving us back the value of z. Um, but we can do something very similar. So we can also say the implicit function theorem here again is telling us that there exists a z star function that for all values of a near a naught, um, we'll be able to spit out a, a solution, uh, a fixed point solution. So similarly, we can do, uh, you know, we can apply the, the chain rule here. Um, and just as before, we can see that the Jacobian of z star that we're after is now in this equation with just these uh, these matrices. And so if we rearrange things, we get a very similar uh, expression to, uh, to before. We just sort of have an identity matrix thrown in. Um, great, so this is now sort of the mathematics underlying how we're going to differentiate uh, fixed point solution mappings um, more efficiently. <clears throat> However, we've been in math world. We need to connect this to automatic differentiation tools. Um, so Let's just briefly review how you know what what fundamental ideas are automatic differentiation tools built on. Um, so there's really two main uh, uh, capabilities of an automatic differentiation tool, two sort of uh, uh, dual ideas. The first um, thing that an automatic differentiation tool gives you is the ability to compute Jacobian vector products. So this just means the ability to, given uh, you know a vector representing a perturbation to some input, be able to compute what the Jacobian of a function um, applied to that vector is. So that tells you what the perturbation on, corresponding perturbation on the output would look like. Um, so <clears throat> this is basically saying, you know, instead of being able to compute Jacobians directly, automatic differentiation tools give us ways to evaluate these Jacobian vector products. Um, and that means that they, they're free not to have to instantiate the entire Jacobian of f if they don't want to. Um, they can sort of be matrix free. So we affectionately abbreviate these things JVPs for Jacobian vector product. Um, and it's related to the idea of a push forward mapping in mathematics and differential geometry. 
And this is also basically the idea that's instantiated in forward mode automatic differentiation. And the way I like to think about um, Jacobian vector products is if you did want to build a Jacobian, uh, full Jacobian for your function, you could do it with one column. Uh, you could do it one column at a time. Sort of, if I gave you, or your software system gave you a way of evaluating Jacobian vector products, you could feed in one hot vectors for V, and for each one you'd reveal a column of the Jacobian matrix. Great, so that's one of the two fundamental pieces of uh, automatic differentiation. Um, the other uh, is the vector Jacobian product, which computes something very similar, except instead of taking the Jacobian and hitting it with a vector on the right, we sort of hit it with a vector on the left. So we abbreviate these uh, VJPs. It's related to the idea of uh, a pullback mapping in mathematics. And this is really what's instantiated in reverse mode automatic differentiation. Um, the way I like to think about these is that if you had uh, uh, a way of evaluating the vector Jacobian product for any you know, Python function, that would let you build the Jacobian for the, uh, the mathematical function that, that, that Python evaluates one row at a time. Right? By again, sort of feeding in one hot vectors, we can reveal one row of the Jacobian at a time. Um, now, <clears throat> it turns out that for machine learning and gradient-based optimization and the sort of thing, vector Jacobian products are sort of the most important uh, 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 tool in this toolbox. And the reason is that if you think you want to optimize a, uh, a loss function of a neural network, you can think of that loss function as taking sort of a billion inputs for your billion neural network parameters and um, outputting a single scalar value, which is the, the loss value. And so um, if you like the Jacobian of that loss function as a function of parameters, it's going to be a matrix that's going to be one by a billion. And so if I tell you, um, I'll either give you a tool to evaluate Jacobian vector products that lets you evaluate a Jacobian one column at a time, so you'd have to call it a billion times, or uh, I'll give you VJPs, vector Jacobian products, that let you reveal this Jacobian one row at a time, you'd much rather have vector Jacobian products because you can do it in a single call. You can see this entire uh, Jacobian of the loss function. So that gives you your gradient. You can optimize more effectively. Um, so this is really the, the, the focus, and this is what we'll focus on uh, in this section of the talk on vector Jacobian products. But in our notes online, we have a bit more about both forward mode JVPs and reverse mode VJPs. So great, let's go back to our um, uh, the equation that we worked out telling us about the Jacobian of our solution mapping Z star for uh, fixed points. Um, how do we you know, tie this into automatic differentiation systems? Uh, we need to work out how to compute a vector Jacobian product uh, for Z star. And that'll let us uh, plug into uh, automatic differentiation systems. So let's take a look at how to do that. We basically just have to take this uh, equation that we worked out and say, OK, what if I hit it with a, a vector on the left? If I want to be able to compute W transpose uh, times the Jacobian of Z star. Um, well, we can you know, apply that on the right as well. And you know, here's an expression for what the vector Jacobian product must be. Um, we can simplify that uh, a little bit and say, let's let U be the vector. Um, that's the result of that first term there. So W transpose times this uh, inverse matrix. Well, let's just call that uh, result U. Um, and then what's interesting, if you massage this a little bit, is you can say that if I take that definition of u and I rearrange uh, uh, some terms, we can actually write um, the value of u itself uh, in this way. We can say that u has to satisfy this equation. And what's really nice uh, with u satisfying this equation is that this is actually a fixed point equation of its own. Um, and so, in fact, what we've worked out here is that we can write a VJP for our fixed point solution mapping in terms of VJPs of f. Right? So we have these two VGPs of f. And moreover, we can think of a computation we have to do as itself a linear fixed point um, uh, function uh, in terms of these VJPs. So the details here aren't um, terribly important, but the high level structure I want you to remember is uh, you know, we should see VJPs of our function f. Um, and we can compose those together, together with solving a, a fixed point um, in the backward pass to be able to get our VJP for our solution mapping Z star. Great, so um, that's the math. <clears throat> Let's see how we can use this to power up our code and do differentiation more efficiently. Um, great, so here we are back in our notebook. Let's just review what we had before. We had this fixed point layer. Um, 
it was great. It you know could could solve for fixed points with us for any solver we we give it, um, and we could differentiate through it uh, to get gradients. But as we saw before, that was going to be very memory inefficient. And what we want to do now is use the mathematics we just worked out to say we don't need to differentiate through the iterations of our solver. Um, we don't need to store all that memory and, and spend all that time. Instead, all we need to do is have the solver find that fixed point for us, that sort of Z0 and A0, if you like. Um, and as long as you know we find that fixed point, at that fixed point, uh, we can just do differentiation there, basically by linearizing our um, fixed point function at that point and then solving those linear equations. Great, so let's um, do that. So this is just uh, how we would set up a custom VJP in JAX. So we're using this custom VJP decorator. Now the details here aren't uh, you know, important for uh, the purpose of the talk. Please take a look at the code afterwards if you, if you wanna see uh, the details. But let's just notice the sort of high level structure that we're seeing uh, from the math. So just like before, we said that we won't need to save um, anything but our sort of you know, solution point, our, our fixed point uh, solution and the parameters that went into this layer. Um, and then we'll be able to do our backward pass, our VJP computation, um, just by using VJPs of F. So we had two VJPs. We had a VJP of F with respect to the parameters um, that we're calling A in the mathematics. We see that on this line. And then on this line, we see a VJP of F with respect to the variable Z. So we've got our two VJPs. And then we see that we're also call, calling our sort of fixed point solver. Um, so you don't have to do this, but the way we've set up this particular code is we're going to use the same solver uh, to solve our sort of um, linear fixed point for the uh, for the VJP computation, the same one that we used to find the nonlinear fixed point in the in the sort of forward pass uh, computation. Great, so let's run that. That's going to define a uh, custom VJP here, and now we can just differentiate our fixed point layer like before and get some answers out. Um, you might say, you know, what? What have we accomplished? It seems like we're getting the same numbers. So if we memorize a couple, you know, this is 007 and, and negative 0.812, we're getting about the same answers as we did before. What have we accomplished here? Um, well, let's take a look at uh, this grad graph again. Um, and we can see that instead of differentiating through all the iterations, all the unrolled iterations of our fixed point solver, now with this custom VJP, we basically just have one sort of step in the, in the backward pass graph. Now the details aren't important, but remember all those yellow nodes were representing uh, stored uh, memory that was going to be really costly. This is basically saying now when we differentiate through this layer, we're not going to be storing a ton of memory through these unrolled uh, iterations. We're just going to be storing um, you know, a few uh, small values, so it's not going to be terribly expensive. Um, great, so that, that graph was a little boring. Let's see you know, a slightly more realistic toy uh, version of this. Um, so let's imagine the simplest uh, way of embedding this in a kind of uh, neural network um, architecture. So here we have a very simple uh, prediction function for a neural network. Uh, we just sort of have three layers. The first one, it's a fully connected layer with a tanh nonlinearity. Then the second one is gonna be our fixed point layer. Um, so sort of in the middle of our network. And then finally, we'll have a linear layer. Um, and just to complete this toy example, we'll write a simple loss function where we uh, are using sort of our squared error loss comparing the predictions to the targets. Um, great, so <clears throat> let's do that and let's just initialize some random data, some random inputs and, and targets and parameters. Um, and let's just look at what the grad graph would look like in this slightly more uh, realistic example. And again, we can see uh, when we differentiate through this thing, our sort of implicit layer is actually just this little bit in the middle here. We sort of have uh, differentiation for the last, uh, or for the, for the first layer uh, uh, rather, and then this is for the last layer, just some matrix vector multiplies. And instead of getting that big unrolled computation graph, we can just plug this fixed point layer into our network and still uh, you know, uh, uh, not have memory blow up. Um, great, and just to you know, emphasize that we can do some fancy auto diff here, we don't need to uh, you know, hold ourselves back. Here's a simple function uh, using grad to compute Hessian vector products. And so you know, we can compute some Hessian vector product uh, uh, using this custom differentiation rule. And again, this is just gonna be using a small amount of memory because we're using the implicit function theorem to do our differentiation rather than um, differentiating through all the iterations. So we can even do higher order reverse mode auto diff here. Great, so <clears throat> uh, just to review the high level takeaways, um, you know, the, the you know, first thing was just that we can always differentiate with modern auto diff tools through a computation like a fixed point solver. Um, so you can always do that uh, if you want, but it's gonna be very memory inefficient and it might be flop inefficient and numerically unstable as well. So 
when you do implicit layers, you probably don't want to just differentiate through your, your solver. Um, instead, we can do something much better, which is to use implicit differentiation. Um, and that basically means use the implicit function theorem and derive uh, an expression for our, uh, our, our derivative or you know, our, our VJP computation. And the most important fact that we worked out there is that we only need to know about the final solution point, the sort of final fixed point. It doesn't matter how our iterative solver got there, what path it took when it was iterating to find that fixed point. We only need to be able to evaluate derivatives at that fixed point, And therefore, we're going to be able to save a lot of memory because we don't have to remember the details. Um, and maybe just you know a high level uh, feeling when we're doing things like solving nonlinear equations or uh, nonlinear uh, fixed point systems. Um, sort of uh, if we have a nonlinear solve uh, on the forward pass that we're trying to differentiate, uh, when we do implicit differentiation, we end up with something that looks like we'll just linearize at the solution point, and then instead of solving nonlinear equations, we just have to solve linear equations uh, to compute the the gradient. Um, so that's the sort of high level feel. Great. And with that. I think uh, we can hand it back over um, to Zico. Thanks, Matt. So next up, we're going to talk briefly, actually, about diving into a bit more detail about the models that we saw previously. These kind of fixed point iteration models that in a more generic setting, we're calling deep equilibrium models. And so to motivate kind of the formulation of a deep equilibrium model, um, I do want to sort of admit that the very simple recurrent backprop cell we used previously was, was actually pretty limited, right? So um, just using a single tanh layer, a single linearity, um, it's somewhat limited. Um, and the idea of a DEC model, a deep equilibrium model, is that we're actually going to replace the entire network, an entire deep network, with one of these single equilibrium layers. And so to do that, we actually do, in practice, need to use a more complex function than just a single nonlinearity applied to a linearity. Um, it's something more like a cell, right? So this function f in a deck is more like a residual block, a transformer block, an LSTM cell, etc. And here, I'm writing it as a function of both the fixed point, which we're trying to find, the input x, and the parameters theta because we're going to want to differentiate with respect to all those things. And additionally, the other big important point about deep equilibrium models or DEC models is that we don't actually care how we solve for this fixed point. That's sort of the key point here is that as Matt demonstrated, it doesn't actually matter how you find the fixed point. Um, and so we're free to use actually any nonlinear root finding algorithm we want, which sometimes will even converge even if, for example, naive forward iteration is not stable. And that's really the key idea here. We need a stable algorithm to kind of solve this, this, this fixed point and then uh, use the same or a similar algorithm to compute the backward pass using implicit differentiation. And this is work that uh, was published last year actually at Neurips. So the way this works is actually exactly like Matt just discussed, but I'll, I'll sort of formulate it here in the context of a, of a deck model, because there typically is just sort of one layer here. There's one layer, um, and in the forward pass, you first, given your input x, you compute the equilibrium point, z star, which is a function of x and the parameters of the layer, and then you compute some loss function as a function of this equilibrium point, right? And that typically involves you know, a single linear layer to, to, to give you logic outputs, and then something like a cross entropy loss. Now in the backward pass, we need to compute gradients of that layer, and we're doing this exactly with the same implicit function theorem that Matt just discussed, we're using the same implicit function theorem that Matt, that Matt just discussed. In particular, this is exactly the form of the uh, gradient that Matt gave previously, and we compute this inverse also using an indirect method based upon some iterative procedure. And so there are a few more details here that I want to highlight just because the details are, of course, a little bit important here. Um, I'm not going to go into it, into it too much, uh, but in practice, how we compute the fixed point really does matter uh, to the practicality of these layers. Because the layer now, this function f, uh, being you know, a recurrent cell or an LSTM cell or a transformer, 
This is, of course, going to be the main computational block of the whole function, right? Running that function f, really running it a number of times in order for this thing to converge. And so we want to, in some sense, try to find a fixed point using as few calls to the function f as possible. And just running forward iteration is typically a very inefficient way of doing this, but so is Newton's method, because Newton's method requires forming an enormous Jacobian, which you can't really do in practice. So in practice, what we do is use something kind of in between, which is an accelerated fixed point method. Um, and one that we've been using a lot recently is called Anderson acceleration, which is a generic method for accelerating fixed point iterations. And we actually use this for the forward pass and the backward pass, because it turns out that in the backward pass, we're solving a linear system. Anderson acceleration is actually equivalent to the GM res indirect method. Now, all the details of this are actually going to be in that companion uh, website. We have code and uh, notes that describe all of this. And they're written in PyTorch too. Uh, as I was telling Matt, I'm not, I'm not yet cool enough to use Jack, so I still am stuck in the days of using PyTorch, the semi-cool days of PyTorch, right? Um, but it's all there, and you can look how this actually works. It's, about, it's less than 100 lines of code to create a convolutional ResNet-based deck model, which will get, without data augmentation with a small number of parameters, will get 82% accuracy or something like that on CFAR, which is, of course, not, not great accuracy, but for a very small model with no augmentation, it's fairly good uh, for that size of parameters. And that's all in the, uh, in the other documents. Okay, but let's see what this looks like um, in practice in a second, but first let's talk about some of the theory. So the nice thing about deck models is we actually have some very nice theory about how they work and how expressive they are. So you may still be thinking that, you know, we've gone from a deep network to literally trying to compute everything with a single layer. And this seems like, yes, it kind of, you know, yes, a fixed point is maybe more expressive than uh, a normal linear and nonlinear layer combined, but is it really that expressive? Maybe we're losing a lot of something. Maybe this won't work very well in practice if we literally just take the whole network as this one layer. And so these proofs here, these theorems here, at least highlight a little bit about why that's not the case. So the first theorem that we have about DEX is that a single layer DEC, so a single layer fixed point iteration essentially, can represent any feed forward deep network. And this is actually a very simple statement here. The proof intuition is that you just stack all the hidden layers together. So you can imagine if you have a whole unrolled network, you take every element in the compute graph and put that in our vector z and have the function f just be kind of a shifted application of every layer in the compute graph. Now, of course, that's not a very good thing to do in practice because you're still storing the whole hidden unit. Therefore, you're storing all the memory of the compute graph anyway. And by the way, you're applying every single operation at every single iteration of f. So it's not a good idea to do in practice, but at least in theory, this captures why one layer is sufficient theoretically to express uh, a deep feedforward network. And that's actually with no increase in parameters. This is, not about, this is not about universal function approximation. This is about the same number of parameters. You can, be, you can do the same thing with a fixed point iteration as you can, or finding a fixed point, as you can with, a, with any deep network. Uh, so that's very nice. Uh, of course, in practice, you know, we have a smaller, we don't do that. We have just a small sort of normal cell that we maybe make a little bit bigger to match parameter counts, but this is a nice theory to have. The second theorem that we have is that a single layer deck can also represent any multi-layer deck. So, um, you know, as, as deep learning people, the first thing we hear about when we hear about a powerful layer is, oh, maybe we can stack those together uh, and have a better architecture too. And the, 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 the truth though is that this doesn't actually help here. So any multi-layer deck can actually be represented by a single layer deck. And the proof is very similar. You just take, if you have two equilibrium models where the output of one is an input into the next one, you just stack those two together and have your function f be a simultaneous equilibrium over both of them. So you can always solve equilibrium kind of in a simultaneous fashion. And therefore, this is why we have the the catchy slogan, which is you know great for everything these days in, in deep learning, where one implicit layer for a deck is actually all you need. But look, we even have proofs here that prove it, uh, unlike those other papers that claim similar things. Now, I should highlight there are some, still some missing points of this theory. For example, they don't uh, say anything about the guaranteed existence of an equilibrium point uh, or the uniqueness of it. 
or whether in fact a method will be stable, like Anderson acceleration is going to be stable for finding it. Those are all real issues that we uh, actually have addressed in, in more recent work, but which we're not going to talk about uh, here today. What I do want to highlight uh, briefly, though, in the rest of, of this section is the results that we can get. Because the nice thing about DEX is they actually are competitive with the state of the art in deep learning for similar size and similarly trained architectures. So for example, using uh, uh, for the language modeling task, we trained a DEC variant of a transformer model, as well as a DEC variant of a different model called a trellis net model, to model a, a language modeling task on Wikitext 103, which is a standard data set, a standard reasonably large scale data set for language modeling. And what we find is that for the same number of parameters, um, so a transformer XL is sort of a, a reasonably nice um, transformer model. And what we find is for the same number of parameters, um, so this is a relatively small model, the DEC model typically gets better performance. Here we're measuring performance with perplexity, which is lower is better, and it uses much less memory. So better performance because well, it works as well. Uh, it's a deeper model, too, in some sense. It has more uh, non-linearities, I guess, because it's an infinite number in some sense, uh, and less memory because uh, of the implicit function theorem and implicit differentiation. And this holds pretty steadily over uh, a variety of model sizes and a variety of different model architectures. I should mention, of course, that these are not state-of-the-art results. On Wikitext 103, you can do much better, just with even bigger models. But for every time where we compare similarly sized models, uh, we, we are in fact typically a little bit better and definitely lower memory consumption. Now, it is true, however, that there is something kind of fundamentally, um, uh, something about the deck model present so far that seems to have a hard time uh, applying itself to things like vision tasks. Um, because in vision tasks, actually, depth sort of plays two roles. In, the, in one sense, depth increases the capacity of the network, but depth in, in, in a vision model, it typically also involves subsampling data or stratic convolutions which downsample data. And you really want to have this representation of images at multiple different feature resolutions. So, to address this problem, actually this year in NeurIPS, and I want to highlight these results very briefly, we presented an idea that actually extends these deck models to a multi-scale setting, where the idea is you actually represent in your hidden unit multiple spatial scales of features simultaneously. You feed each of these through a residual block. You mix them all together by upsampling and downsampling, and you treat this whole thing as the joint F that you want to solve. Um, so this whole thing is driven to an equilibrium point. And then the cool thing about this is you can actually, you have kind of converged feature maps for both high resolution and low resolution inputs, which lets you actually use the exact same model for a class like, uh, for, 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 for a task like image classification as for a task like semantic segmentation. So without any notion of backbones or more complex architectures, you can use the same architecture for one. The big point that I want to highlight here, though, is that by incorporating structure within this single layer, within a single kind of cell, you actually can create models that are very powerful, that have a lot of structure with, uh, in them, and which can solve very hard tasks. So in particular, uh, this model, again, on something like ImageNet for similar sized models, again, with similar training techniques, nothing too fancy here. Um, we're not quite the state of the art, certainly there are better models, but we're pretty competitive with good architectures like ResNets, et cetera. Um, and as you scale the model bigger, you see similar effects. Of course, the, the sort of more interesting thing, again, as I said, is that you can take this same model and apply it to a domain like semantic segmentation. So for the cityscapes, which is a semantic segmentation task, um, Again, we are, for the similar model size, we are the, the, the multi-scale deck is competitive with the um, existing state of the art while uh, using the exact same models for classification. And in fact, in this case, actually, the, the 81 MIOU actually is a state of the art, so we're, we're pretty close to state of the art here, uh, while being an implicit layer. And previously, implicit layers, while they've been thought of as powerful, they haven't that much been applied to sort of these large-scale very kind of state-of-the-art uh, computer vision tasks, 
And so the point of all this that we want to highlight is that this really is possible here, and we can get these extremely strong results in practice using implicit layers. And so to end here, I just want to show the requisite video of, uh, we don't have quite as many cool videos as for, for DEX as David is about to show you for neural ODEs, but we do have a cool video showing pretty good semantic segmentation on a task like cityscapes. Um, so, you know, it, there's certainly some, some you know, blipping out around the corners where it can't quite tell between, you know, a sidewalk and a, and a building and stuff like that. But for the most part, this is pretty good. Um, you sort of see, you sort of see that it, it's, it's working pretty well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave uh, to talk about neural ODEs. Okay, thank you, Zico. So now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about neural ordinary differential equations. So to, re to refresh, the idea is that there's some vector value of state, Z, uh, which follows some dynamics function F. And F can be defined using a neural network or like a ResNet block or any, any sort of architecture you want with a few constraints. Um, and again, we're going to define an implicit layer as the solution of an ODE at some finite integration time, starting at our input x. Um, the solution, this solution is actually unique and it's continuously differentiable with respect to the input x, as long as the ODE solution exists, which requires f to be uh, Lipschitz and continuously differentiable everywhere. So in particular, this means we can't actually use radio units uh, when we define in the ne neural network that defines f, but there's lots of nonlinearities that do work. For instance, tan h. Okay, so just like with dex, we have total freedom about how we solve this integral um, to get the final state of the ODE. Uh, the simplest way is called Euler's method, and it basically just says let's take finite steps um, in the direction of f, and this looks a lot like a residual network. So just to show this visually, the idea is that we're starting. The, the exact solution is some curve that's impossible to compute exactly. We can only approximate it. Um, so Euler says, OK, starting at this point, we're going to take a small step in the direction of f, where these little uh, arrows show the, the direction of the uh, gradient field. And at this new point, we're going to event, again evaluate f, ask which direction to go in, and then take a finite uh, size step in that direction. And we keep doing this, and this will give us an approximation to the true solution. However, it's not a, it's not a great um, strategy in terms of the computational costs for the acquisition that we get. And just like for DEX, we can use any solver that's been developed. And in fact, the field of differential equation solving is a very mature one. It's like more like 120 years old. So we have the scope to use all sorts of fancy adaptive solvers, which will make local um, extrapolations and only take many steps when the dynamics are complicated. OK, so just to make the connection really explicit and to show you in pseudocode how you might code up in ordinary, like a neural ODE or an ODE net, um, first I'm going to show pseudocode for a residual neural, neural network. So on the right here, I'm showing uh, just what a one-dimensional residual neural network might like, look like, where we start at the input at the bottom, and every layer gives an update to the state, depending on a little neural network f, uh, which takes the current state this is like the hidden units of our neural network, the, the layer number, which we'll call t, and the parameters of that layer. So all we need to do is get the current layer's weights and the current state and pass that to our little neural network, whatever it is, maybe a few layers of continent or, or who knows what. Um, putting these together into a residual network just looks like an iteration over every layer where we add the dynamics function to the current state. OK, so as uh, Zico mentioned, we don't actually have to have different parameters at every layer in the network. In fact, we can, without loss of generality, make the neural network take one set of parameters and then also just have its uh, inputs know what depth it's at. So this is like a sort of almost cosmetic change that we're making to the architecture, the network architecture. But it means that in principle, we could evaluate this neural network at any layer or any depth, even in between these discrete uh, layers. So if we did that, we could say, oh, this residual neural network is really just using Euler's method to solve a, this differential equation f. Um, so we are actually free, if we want to, to replace the, that particular solver with any fancy ODE solver that's been developed by the numerics community. And then solving uh, differential equations using this way, or using an adaptive solver, will 
require evaluating this dynamics function at a bunch of different locations and depths that are determined on the fly by the ODE solver. So I'm going to say that you can replace a residual network with a neural ODE anywhere, and the, the types will match. Right? It, it's, it's a neural network that has its output dimension being the same as the input dimension. However, the class of functions that you can learn with uh, an ODE net is not quite the same as that of a residual network. So just to use a simple example, imagine we're learning a one-dimensional function, uh, y is x squared. Uh, so here is what the activations of a residual neural network learning this function look like. So for um, 5, we map, we get larger until we go to 25, 0 goes to 0, negative 5 jumps over and then also goes to 25. Um, so this is a non-bijective transformation because we're mapping two inputs to the same output. However, if I try to learn this function with the neural ODE, I end up not being able to. Um, and the fundamental difficulty is that ODE solutions, or the trajectories, internally can't cross over each other. And that's just by construction. So the best that this neural network can do is map all the positive reals to their corresponding squares, and all the negative reals get, can map, be mapped close to 0. But there's no way for us to cross these trajectories to actually learn a non-bijective function. So that, sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. In high dimensions, it's not, as, it's not usually a problem. But there are situations where we have to augment the number of states in our hidden units to achieve the same expressivity. So the, one of the main benefits for moving to this implicit formula, just like in deep equilibrium models, is that, again, we're free to compute the answer however we want. Um, so without getting into the exact algorithms used by these methods, usually what they do is, as they're solving these, um, these ODEs, they fit a local polynomial to these dynamics, and then try to estimate the extrapolation error that they would make if they went a finite, dif uh, finite distance along the trajectory. And so they're going to take steps such that that extrapolation error st stays small enough, and then when it gets too large, they're going to stop and start again. Um, so the upshot is that when the dynamics are complex, we might need a lot of evaluations of the dynamics function. But when they're simple, we might need fewer evaluations. So this is a form of adaptive computation. The other big benefit that neural ODEs share with deep, e deep equilibrium models is that we can adjust the tolerance or the precision of the solver at any time. So in particular, these adaptive solvers have a parameter, or maybe two for like absolute and relevant, or sorry, relative tolerance, um, that we can loosen if we want to have a less precise answer at, uh, for us at the cost of fewer function evaluations. Okay, so I mean the downside of this is that we can't actually explicitly control the number of function evaluations that it takes to evaluate these models, um, and we see during training typically that. The number of function evaluations, at least this f, this little neural network, um, it requires more evaluations to get a given precision as the um, training proceeds. And the idea being that at initialization, usually we have a relatively simple function that we have to integrate, and that function will become more complicated as it fits the data. <coughs> um, so, all right. So, I want to talk a little bit about how to train ODE nets. And again, this, all this math can be derived using the implicit function theorem. I'm going to use a simpler derivation based on residual networks. But the problem that we have to solve if we want to scalably train any parametric differentiable model is how to compute gradients of some scalar loss with respect to you know, a million or a billion parameters. So in particular, we'll say that you know, we'll have some ODE solution as part of our model that eventually gets turned into a scalar loss. How do we compute the gradient of the scalar loss with respect to the parameters? Um, well, it turns out that we can just derive the answer by taking the infinitesimal limit of the standard backprop rules for a residual network. So in a, in a residual network, we start with the loss at the final layer, so uh, the scalar loss with respect to the uh, output layer zt. And there's a recurrence that says, how do I get the um, <coughs> gradient with respect to the next layer, or the previous layer? And it just involves a vector times a Jacobian, which, as Matt explained, is cheap, and it's what reverse mode automatic differentiation gives you, also known as backprop. Um, and then computing the gradient of the loss with respect to all the parameters ends up just being a sum over all the layers of the local gradient with respect to the state times this Jacobian of how does the update depend on the parameters. Okay, so these are all operations that are rel readily available in any automatic differentiation package and are cheap to compute. They have the same asymptotic time cost as the forward evaluation. Um, so uh, this is actually, you know, the continuous time version has actually been worked out um, 
in the '60s and is you know used in many different situations in the, in the numerics community. Um, but if we take the continuous time limit of these uh, residual equations as we have more and more steps, each of which makes a smaller and smaller update, we end up getting a, another differential equation that says that the, um, the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters is just the integral of, again, vector Jacobian products, the same vector Jacobian products that we computed when we were uh, evaluating the gradient of the residual network. So um, when we want to code up the gradient of an ODE uh, or loss with respect to the initial state or the parameters of an ODE, we can actually just express that as another call to our ODE solver, where we're asking it to run some augmented dynamics that um, contain both the original uh, forward neural network and these augmented dynamics, which require vector Jacobian products. And we'll go into this in more detail in the, um, in the tutorial document. Um, but this is everything we need to explain how we can compute gradients with more, like with constant memory. So the usual bottleneck for memory in computing backdrop for big neural networks is that we have to store the activations of every layer as we go through our model. Um, we, when we're solving ODEs, there's actually an alternate way to reconstruct all the activations of the hidden units um, backwards in time in the order that we need them. So specifically, ODE solvers let us start at an initial state and then compute a trajectory to get to the final state. If we know that final state, we can just run the same dynamics backwards in time using the same sort of ODE solver and reconstruct this state arbitrarily accurately. Um, so I want to mention that there are a few different works that do the same thing in neural networks where they compute, where they structure the network layers in such a way that you can reverse them analytically. However, this requires you to restrict the network architecture. The nice thing here is that as long as we are continu continuously differentiable in dipshits, we can use any neural network architecture and still do this um, reversal. Of course, this is another source of numerical error. We're already going to be accumulating numerical error on the reverse pass, and sometimes we won't be able to uh, feasibly reconstruct this trajectory exactly. However, um, if the reverse system is stiff, we can detect that usually, and then stop and do checkpointing, and for instance, like just maybe store a few different intermediate states and work backwards from there. OK, so you know, we've described these two families of models. Deep, 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 Deep equilibrium models and neural ODEs, and we said they have very similar um, properties. So when would you like to use which one? Um, so in particular, they both have constant memory training costs. They both let you adjust the compute versus precision at test time by adjusting those tolerances, and they both have this sort of like infinite or automatically adjusting depth. Um, I would say um, you should probably use neural ODEs when you care about the trajectory for some reason. For instance, if you're modeling continuous time series or doing something with physics, or as I'm going to talk about next, building normalizing flows. And the reason for that is that the change of variable is sort of is easier to compute in most instances. OK, so now I'm going to talk about one of the major things that's been allowed by moving to continuous time, which is more advanced normalizing flow models. So when I say normalizing flows, I mean a set of tractable, tractable probabilistic models based on the change of variables formula. And they require us to parameterize an invertible transformation, which will then tell us how to convert some known tractable density into a complicated parametric density that still has the, the normalization constant available, which means we can compute the density under this transformed um, model, which lets us train by maximum likelihood. So compared to GANs, these are trainable by standard stochastic gradient descent, which makes them very appealing. And so the first uh, instances of these models that really took off uh, were like the first main one was called real, or the first scalable one was called real um, MVP, which required this restricted architecture, but it operated in discrete time. Um, so the way those were trained is that they use the change of variables formula, which says that if I start with some variable x0, move it through some function f that's invertible, um, then the density of the resulting variable will be the original density times the determinant of the Jacobian of the function that transformed x. So this determinant is scary. It has a cubic cost to compute and, again, uh, to invert. So the way around this that people have been doing is to restrict the architecture of their dynamics function such that it has a structured Jacobian, such that we can use tricks from linear algebra to efficiently compute this determinant in something more like O of d squared or O of d time. So the standard approaches are to either make it low rank or somehow sparse or lower triangular. 
So this is fine if you have enough layers, but you have to have a lot of layers to make up for this restricted architecture in some domains. Um, so if we talk about the instantaneous change of variables, we can ask, you know, if I say that a, the rate of change of x is given by some function f, then the rate of change of density of f is also given by a differential equation, which depends only on the trace of the Jacobian of this f, this dynamics function. And the trace is always O of d cost. Um, this Jacobian, of course, costs d squared, but we're going to talk a little bit about how to get around that d squared in a second. And the nice thing is that this is um, this allows us to use like any architecture for this f, so we'll need fewer layers. Of course, we will still need to compute an integral, which has infinitely, infinitely many layers, but the hope is that approximating that in integral will still require fewer evaluations than the number of layers we would need if we use the restricted architecture. OK, so and what this looks like in practice is, again, we have some uh, normalized density that's, that's simple. We let it follow some differential equation that's been defined by a neural network here. And then we end up with another normalized density that has some complicated parametric shape. OK, um, so there's one more trick that we need to be able to scale these models to high dimensions, and that is Hutchinson's trace trick. So again, I'm saying that the uh, for continuous normalizing flows, the change in density can be computed as the integral of the divergence of f, which is, again, can be written as the trace of the Jacobian of f. That's the same thing. And this Jacobian, again, is d squared, which is uh, unacceptable for, like, for large models. Um, so Hutchinson's trace trick says that we can get an unbiased estimate, an unbiased stochastic estimate of the trace of a matrix by just hitting it with a random vector from the left and the right, as long as that random vector has um, zero mean and unit variance. So in particular, when we're training, we can sample a unit vector at every iteration, integrate the um, Jacobian times this vector, and that will give us a, a linear time operation that lets us estimate the change in density. So again, now moving to even higher dimensions, what generating images looks like in that setting is every dimension here um, is drawn from a Gaussian initially, and then it follows this differential equation that shows how to turn this Gaussian density into uh, the manifold of natural images. And of course, we can do interpolation in this setting just like with all other latent variable models. OK, so one thing I've been sweeping under the rug a little bit here is this absolute and relative, relative tolerance that says how accurately we want to solve our differential equation. Um, and this might concern us, especially when we're training normalized density models, because the way we compare them is we ask, how, what is their likelihood on held out test data? And you might say, well, if your um, solver has some systematic error in it, then probably during training, you're going to learn to take advantage of that error in your favor and overestimate the likelihood of your model on held out data. Um, so that's a reasonable worry. And to answer that, we, did, we ran an experiment in one dimension where we asked, OK, as we adjust the solver tolerance on a trained model, how does the actual um, normalization constant of that model change? So it should, if it's a normalized, if it's truly a normalized model, we should estimate that its uh, integral is 1. And we can ask, how does our estimated normalization differ from 1 as a function of this tolerance that we've asked the solver um, to give us? So, and this is a really, really reassuring graph. At least in one dimension, the amount of error in the normalization of our model is pretty close, tracks pretty closely the error that we asked the solver to give us on our, um, on our estimates. So again, the nice thing about this is that if you really care about accurate evaluation, you can you know, make the tolerance tighter and then spend more time evaluating and get a better answer. If you're, having, you want, you're running on low power mode on a phone, you can loosen the tolerances and have everything work faster at a lower precision without ever having to retrain the model. So one of the other um, places where continuous normalizing flows help us is that um, I mentioned earlier that neural ODs are restricted to learning homeomorphisms. Um, and I think for regression, we might think that's a bad thing. But it's useful when we're wanting to model 3D shapes, for instance, which we don't want to have, uh, which we don't want to self-intercept. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, there, if we want to do change of variables in exotic uh, spaces, such as on manifolds, again, it turns out that the math is simpler um, in continuous time. So again, once we've trained this model, we have a density 
that starts off as something simple, close to uniform, and then it's gradually following a differential equation on a manifold to produce some complicated parametric density that we can evaluate. Um, very recently, uh, a group from Stanford, um, led by Yang Song, came up with an alternate method of training these besides maximum likelihood. And I, I don't have time to go into it uh, in detail, but the basic idea is to ask, if, what if we had a stochastic differential equation that was mapping our um, simple density into our parametric density? And again, this looks like uh, turning noise into an image, or rather learning how to reverse the process of starting with an image and adding noise. Um, it turns out that although you need to use this SDE formulation to train them to evaluate these models, you can convert the SDE into an ODE that says how the density changes, um, and thus evaluate these using adaptive ODE solvers, just like the standard continuous normalizing flows. Um, and due to the uh, particular construction they use of the the noising process, they can train these much more scalably, in fact, getting large accurate, or sorry, large high resolution images. Um, and again, the advantage of this approach to modeling images over something like a GAN is that we now define a density that we can evaluate in principle. Um, we have this stochastic evaluation of it, but we can evaluate that as many times as we, as we need to to uh, get an arbitrarily accurate estimate. Um, and because we've explicitly defined a joint density over all the pixels on the image, we can answer all sorts of queries about those images. For instance, what is uh, like? How can we take a sample of the rest of the image, conditioning on only a part of it? And we can see that we have a diverse set of possible in paintings of the rest of the image. Um, another example of this is if we condition only on the sum of the colors of every pixel, can we sample the you know the hue and saturation? And uh, this is a form of in painting as well that this model can do without having been trained specifically to do it. So now another uh, area that I'm going to talk about neural ODEs for is time series. And this is a situation, this is a setting where you probably, it's not clear how you would use a deep delivery model. In fact, it's not really clear how you would use any discrete time model um, in order to do all the things that we want to do in continuous time. Um, so again, as I mentioned previously, there's been a lot of work in the last couple of years of uh, building complicated physical models and having them obey the constraints that we know that natural models have to, uh, have to obey. So in particular, we know that real physical systems can be uh, seen as obeying different Hamiltonians or Lagrangians, depending on how you, uh, which coordinate system you use. And without specifying the entire uh, set of dynamics that they're following, we can still say that they're following some Lagrangian that we're going to learn. And this lets us build realistic physical models which, with less data and which extrapolate much better than ones that have to learn everything from scratch. Um, the other thing we can do with these tools is if we happen to know the entire dynamics of the system, if, we, if we're just working from the known laws of physics, being able to differentiate through these systems uh, lets us do things like tune the initial conditions of some protein folding, or rather the uh, ongoing conditions of some protein folding so that to encourage it to form a particular shape. The most, uh, I think the most, well, important application of neural ODEs that we might see in the next few years is irregularly sampled time sets or data sets. So whenever I've talked to industry practitioners or medical practitioners who are excited about deep learning, they've said, well, the main problem is that my data doesn't look like a giant pile of images or, mat or matrices. It rather looks like a whole bunch of measurements that were made of different individual patients or customers at different times, and they don't really fit into standard deep architectures. So yeah, most of the large parametric models that we have operate in discrete time, such as recurrent neural networks or deep column filters or hidden Markov models. The standard approach to fitting these into a large deep model is to bin the data and, and average the data over, let's say, every hour or every day. But this isn't meeting the data where it lives, and it's starting our data analysis by throwing away a lot of information. Um, so one thing that me and others have been working on is building actual continuous time time series models. And once you move to continuous time, you pretty much are, have to use uh, differential equations to, to describe the dynamics of your models. There are ways that you can adapt um, recurrent neural networks or transformers to take in irregularly sampled data, and we'll talk about that a little bit in the um, document. But I would say a natural and interpretable model is to say that there is some hidden state of the system that we're uh, uncertain about, and we 
to learn the dynamics of how those systems evolve through time. So the idea here is that if we're modeling patients, um, this Z might, might represent the state of health of a patient. The F that we learn would represent human physiology that's shared amongst all people. And then these uh, observations would be all the different sorts of like, could be doctor's notes or temperature or blood pressure, anything that's measured about the patient at any time. As long as we can write down a differentiable likelihood with respect to it, or with respect to the latent state, we can jointly train these models end-to-end uh, -end using stochastic gradient descent. Um, so here's a toy example of what that looks like, where we have some one-dimensional data, three different trajectories with all sorts of missing uh, times, and we're going to jointly learn the dynamics function and infer the latent state of all these different trajectories. So here is us using stochastic gradient descent, optimizing a variational objective um, to both learn the dynamics, the latent dynamics, as well as uh, fit the states of the different trajectories to data. Um, that model is a little bit funny because it assumes deterministic dynamics. And we want to be able to model the fact that there might be all sorts of little unseen interventions on our states that we don't get to observe, in which case we'll naturally be uh, describing a stochastic differential equation. Um, and another series of work has recently generalized the algorithms for fitting uh, latent ODEs to time series data to latent stochastic differential equations. These are still uh, constant memory and can use adaptive stochastic differential equation solvers. And they end up looking like a Bayesian model where there's a prior uh, stochastic differential equation and then variational inference gives us an approximate posterior stochastic differential equation that goes through the data and is certain where the data is and is less certain where the data isn't. Um, and the thing that's new about this, I mean, stochastic differential equations are, of course, very old. Um, the new part is scalability. And the fact that now every operation in this new training pipeline, like all the ones that we're used to, it scales roughly linearly with the number of parameters, the dimension of the state, um, and the amount of data. OK, so now I'm going to hand it over back to Zico to talk a little bit more about differentiable optimization. All right, thanks, David. Um, so I'm going to finish off the main sections of this talking about, briefly, uh, differentiable optimization. This won't go into quite as much depth as uh, DEX or neural ODEs, but I at least want to highlight some of these ideas here because actually differentiable optimization, um, in some sense, was actually one of the fields that actually kind of brought implicit models to the forefront of, of modern deep learning, and they are still widely used and still widely being explored from many different directions. So the basic idea here is that DEX and neural ODEs, they both impose substantial structure on the nature of the layer. Right? And by doing so, they actually gain a lot of representational power. But there are many other things we can do to also impose very valuable structure on the layer. And one very prominent idea here, which is paid off sort of in a lot of different domains, is that of differentiable optimization. And what I mean by that is the layer is of the form uh, Z star, so the output of the layer here, is some minimization, the argument, so it's in other words, it's the solution of an optimization problem, that is some function of you know, optimizing over some variable Z here, where this variable z are constrained to be in some set, which can depend on the input of the layer. And the objective function also jointly depends on the variable z we're optimizing over, as well as the input to the layer. And so you can think of this as sort of the input to the layer sets up some feasible set in the optimization landscape, and then our, and it also sets up an objective function in that landscape. And then the job of the layer is to find the point that minimizes that objective subject to being in those constraints. Right? And this is a very generic kind of optimization formulation, though of course you can specialize it to a lot of particular problems because a lot of particular problems actually look like, uh, like optimization problems. So I wanna give a quick sense of how this actually works in practice. Um, and the idea is with differentiation here is as you imagine, well, it's the same thing. You apply the implicit function theorem and turn the crank and things kind of work. So I'm actually going to show this in sort of two different ways. The first way, and I think the way that a lot of people kind of derive these things initially, is by thinking of solving an optimization problem as equivalent to finding a solution to a nonlinear set of equations. And so in particular, for any optimization problem, there are a set of 
sufficient and necessary conditions uh, that at least imply global optimality of, 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 a, of a solution. Um, and for convex problems, they actually imply global optimality. And these are known as the Karush Kuhn Tucker or KKD, KKT conditions. So in particular, for a problem like this here on the left, uh, this is a quadratic program. It's a quadratic program that is parameterized by, uh, by x. So there's a quadratic objective and linear constraints, but the objective itself and all the constraints can depend on some input x. And so this solution actually is equivalent to finding some set of points here. So actually z star are the, is the primal solution. It doesn't really matter the details here, but, uh, but nu and lambda end up being the optimal dual solution. And if you can find a set of uh, find a find um, a set of points or some values here that solve these equations, that actually is a solution to the optimization problem. And I won't get into it too much. But basically, the first two say that it's feasible. The second two say that the problem is is um, the dual variables on inequality constraints are positive. The third is known as the or the fourth is known as the complementary complementarity condition, and the fifth is a gradient a gradient condition. And so. We can take these equations, solve them any way we want to, which is exactly how optimization solvers work, and then differentiate them with the using the implicit function theorem to find gradients. And it turns out we don't even need to differentiate the inequalities here because the equality constraints are sufficient locally to actually give a valid gradient here. Now, that's sort of one way of doing it, but the other, maybe even simpler way is to realize that many optimization problems, or optimization algorithms actually, can be written as a fixed point iteration. So for example, you know, we all know, uh, or maybe, hopefully, <laughs> that uh, predicted gradient descent is one way to solve optimization problems. And so one thing we can do is just iterate predicted gradient descent. That just takes the, the gradient of the fun of that takes the current iterate, subtracts off a small multiple of the gradient, and then projects it back onto the constraint set. It's not always easy to form that projection, but in many cases you can do this applies immediately. And then more generally speaking, there are actually much more sophisticated approaches that can solve arbitrary things like arbitrary cone problems. And in fact, a lot of solvers work exactly this way. They set up some fixed point iteration and solve the actual resulting, solve for the resulting fixed point. Sometimes this fixed point actually gives us exactly a primal dual solution like we had for the KKT conditions, but sometimes it operates in some other way. And the beauty, again, of our sort of notion of differentiating fixed point iterations is that it doesn't matter how we find the solution. We can use whatever solver we want, whatever sophisticated solvers, just like with whatever sophisticated differential equation solvers, whatever sophisticated root bonding solvers. We can use whatever optimization procedure we want, find the solution, and then differentiate through that fixed point in order to find gradients. And this works very generically. So I just want to give a few examples of, of, of what's being done here, uh, as well as some pointer to some uh, frameworks that you can test this out with. So some, some cool examples of this, and, and this is just a, a very small selection. There have been many, many more. Um, but some of our uh, original work on QP solving used an example of fitting convex polytopes to data. So given a bunch of sample points, some of which are inside and outside the, the, the point, you can actually fit convex, convex shapes to these regions. Um, another fun example that we did with a slightly more involved uh, optimization procedure, that which, which was actually a differentiable STP solver, would we use it to solve Sudoku problems. Um, Sudoku problems are actually sort of constrained optimization problems um, that are sort of hard for normal deep learning because there's a lot of constraints, global constraints you need to sort of satisfy at the end of the network. And because these things are all end-to-end, -end, we actually even trained it on, on an MNIST version of Sudoku where we put in MNIST digits instead of just giving it the actual, the actual numbers, we gave it the MNIST digit where zero was in this case a blank. It was nice that Sudoku goes with numbers one to nine and a zero that we can use as a blank. Uh, and then in fact, you know, let, let, uh, uh, just so you don't think that maybe we're only using this to do things like solve Sudoku and other sort of fun toy tasks. This has also been used in a lot of real applications, like controlling HVAC uh, in systems, uh, controlling HVAC in building systems using differentiable variants of MPC controllers. So MPC is multiple control. It's a very common control technique. And you and because it's optimization based, you can also differentiate through it to, to learnably control complex systems. And the last point I want to make here is that 
you know, perhaps unlike Dex, though, though we do have some simple examples of this in the in the notes, um, unlike Dex it's, and, and Neural ODs, it's also true that it's sometimes for, for sort of real large scale optimization problems, it actually is a little bit more challenging to write a really good optimizer, especially when you have you know, semi-definite constraints and, and inequality constraints and equality constraints. Writing a good solver takes certainly a bit of time. I mean, it's the same as true for, for ODEs, though there at least you know, simple ones work for a lot of problems too. Um, and so if you want to sort of use a industrial strength convex optimizer to solve your problem, and use this in a differentiable fashion, um, I would actually not recommend trying to code your own you know, iterative fixed point solver to solve the problem. I would recommend you have to try out uh, this library, which was a collaboration between um, my group and Stephen Boyd's group at Stanford, to extend the CVXPy modeling framework, again, it's also out of Stephen Boyd's group at Stanford, to um, allow you to embed kind of very easily modeled convex problems into automatic differentiation toolkits like PyTorch and TensorFlow. And I actually believe there's, they're even working on a JAX version now. If it's not already there, it probably will be there soon. So um, coming soon. Uh, but the idea here of these modeling frameworks like CVXPy is that you can write Python code that looks a lot like the actual sort of mathematical description of the, of, of the optimization problem. So here we have actually a, a uh, an L1 norm minimization problem with an inequality constraint, and that sort of looks very natural in this setting here. And CVXPy layers lets you take this optimization problem and directly embed it as a layer into either PyTorch or TensorFlow. And that's a very powerful sort of tool to let you easily experiment with these things and easily kind of figure out what you might want to do with architectures like this. And then maybe if you if it works well, then maybe you write the, you know, the 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 GPU version that's fully parallelized, it's a little bit faster, uh, but really this 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 first step here, CDFPy layers gives you a very, very good uh, first first step in that. All right, so with that, we are approaching the end of the tutorial, and I'm going to hand it over one more time to David. Though actually the first bit we're going to talk about jointly um, to conclude with some future directions. All right, thank you, Zico. So one thing I want to mention before the end of this tutorial is to talk a little bit more frankly about when we should use deep, deep equilibrium models or neural ODEs. Um, so I, I think I would say that you should use deep equilibrium models as a drop-in replacement for any for deep models used in standard circumstances where you would maybe use a residual network or a very deep transformer or something like that. Um, so in general, when you're doing like standard sort of supervised learning with confnets and resnets or transformers or building a big language model, I think it makes more sense to replace it with a deep equilibrium model just because we don't care about the trajectory of the solution. Yeah, I think that's right. So most of our work on DEX, what we've been trying to think about is sort of um, how you can mimic or improve upon the function of existing deep network structures using this implicit framework, right? So using these layers that converge to equilibrium points. Um, and it's very much based upon this assumption that you sort of are just looking for this one final infinite depth kind of a limit of the computation, and that's good enough. And that's sort of the whole the whole premise is a that sort of you know it's kind of discrete time fundamentally because because it's taking steps per layers, really mimicking existing structures a lot. Um, but then also very importantly, you really don't care about how you got there, right? You just care about the final equilibrium point. Um, that is your features you've converged to, and you know the faster we can get there, the better. So this seems to me like a good replacement for a lot of deep structures where they currently go through a lot of explicit computations to get there, but they don't ever care about the intermediate computation, right? No one cares about the 10th layer of your ResNet. Um, what you care about is the final result. And so that's really where I think DEX makes sense. And I would also agree that you know, neural ODEs make sense when you do care about the trajectory and you need to model these continuous time phenomena and things like this. Yeah, and to be explicit, you can also use neural ODEs in most of these settings. Um, there's like a few more restrictions on the form of the layers and there is uh, and I guess I would say, in, in general, they tend to be a little bit slower than the corresponding deck. Um, I guess one slight, one other difference is that the solution of the ODE is guaranteed to be unique, uh, where that's only true for certain, or you have to take an extra step to make that be the case for deck. Yeah, that's definitely true. So in general, 
There isn't that much we can say about the guaranteed existence of a fixed point for the decks that we've shown here so far, at least. Um, we, we do actually have a paper coming up this year at NeurIP, so it'll be presented, you know, in a couple of days, um, uh, about how you can have a special class of deck mo uh, models called monotone decks that do have this guarantee, and that actually have a very nice uh, additional way of, you know, of, of a bunch more algorithms for computing fixed points. But that's a very specific class that's that's harder. It's not quite as as um, sort of plug and play in some sense as as uh, these other models we're talking about here. And so it does take a little bit more sophistication to have those guarantees for a deck model. Yeah. So then that kind of leaves the these like specialty areas where you would definitely want to use a neural ODE, which is if you're building a continuous time time series model, for instance, if you have a regularly sampled data, or you're building some sort of physical model. Um, Again, if you're building flexible density models, there's advantages to the continuous flow setting. Or if you need to learn, for some reason, a homeomorphism, for instance, if you need to like warp a shape or something like that. So we're going to talk a little bit about a few open problems and future directions in, these, uh, in this general area. And there's, a, there's many more than these. Um, the first one, I think, the thing we haven't mentioned very much about DEX and neural OEs, I'd say their Achilles heel, is that they tend to require more function evaluations than the corresponding uh, like standard fixed discrete architecture for the same level of performance. And again, this is something that we can always tune as, as we go, um, but, it, but in general, the network is going to be able to adapt to a fixed discrete architecture a little bit better than this sort of implicit layer. Yeah, I would just add to that. I think that's definitely true. DEX definitely suffer from that. And typically, training a DEC takes about two to three times longer than training kind of a standard uh, depth network of the same size. And so this is definitely the big challenge remaining because everywhere and every other way they're great, right? They're, they're sort of better performance, no much less memory consumption. But this is obviously a big problem that I think we want to address with these, with these new methods for solving them. Yeah, so we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, there's also, you know, I don't think we've really learned how to take advantage of these low memory architectures. I think no, mostly we've been so far showing that Yes, you can do the things that we used to do that we did that we know works in this new low memory setting, but I think this is a new design, a direction in design space that we can head. Uh, Absolutely. So I would also agree with that. I would just say that, you know, especially given this notion that like the deck module is kind of analogous to a cell, I think it'd be great to start thinking about architecture search and stuff like this for those cells which may give us something very different from the cells that we're used to in deep networks. We just never thought to, really thought to try them because you know, we, we're, doing with what, we're using what works already. And there's a whole new sort of space to explore here. Um, I think there's lots of room for applying things like latent SDEs. Um, people have been fitting, obviously, SDEs to data for a long time, for instance, in finance, but usually only on the order of like tens or hundreds of parameters. Now we can fit millions. Um, and there's also lots of great work going on these days using partial differential equation solvers as a layer. So we're just going to briefly talk about each of these in turn. So I was saying it would be nice if we could somehow reduce the number of function evaluations that are required to solve one of these implicit models. And so there's been a few, uh, couple of papers this year, actually, that tried to, for the neural ODE setting, regularize the dynamics to be easy to solve by a particular solver. So here's a toy example where this shows the um, trajectories of a neural ODE that's learned to map from x to x cubed. Um, and this uh, training to convergence, it still has all these funny little kinks inside, um, which don't actually affect the final solution. So the, the mapping here only depends on the inputs and the outputs. And these extra little swirls in here don't actually add anything to the model. They just slow down the solver. So we can add the sort of wiggliness of the trajectories as, a, as a, something to penalize during training. And so starting from this optimized solution, if we turn on that uh, penalty, we can learn another set of dynamics that has almost exactly the same inputs and outputs, but takes many fewer function evaluations to solve. As you can see here, the red dots are the where the function um, evaluations, evaluations are happening, and there's fewer of them needed to model these smooth looking trajectories. So there hasn't really been very much work done um, on the deck side where we want to regularize a system of equations to be easy to find the solution of with a particular solver. Yeah, I think that in general, sort of fast solving and the iterative methods we use to solve uh, DEX most optimally and tuning, code tuning the architecture and the solver is still a, a big unsolved problem. Right. And so I guess uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that 
this will induce a trade-off, right? Every time we regularize some extra part of our model that's not the original task, we're going to do a little bit worse at that task. Um, fortunately, we have some encouraging results from these initial papers that show that the, the Predo front uh, is not very diagonal, and that if we ha are solving to a fine precision, we can usually decrease the number of function evaluations by some, maybe on this particular toy, uh, example, about half before we start paying a serious penalty in terms of the training loss. Um, another fun direction that um, people are taking this sort of ideas and have been for you know, 30 or 40 years really is let's, let's call it neural partial differential equations or just PDE solvers as a layer. And there's sort of two main ways we, again, can use these ideas. One is just to backpropagate through the uh, PDE solution to fit its parameters to data. And the other one is to try to learn to solve PDEs faster. And there's been some nice work from Princeton recently, actually, of jointly um, amortizing both of these problems at once without ever having to run a slow PDE solver. So obviously, one of the major things that's changed in the last few years is the ease of implementing these ideas. And I won't have time to go through each of these, but for later reference, all of the demos that we showed, almost all of them have code available um, in both PyTorch and JAX, um, including the complex optimization as a layer. OK, so that's the end of the tutorial. And I want to thank all of our collaborators, who are unfortunately too numerous to name individually. Uh, but they, of course, did the bulk of this work. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming to our tutorial. Yes, thanks, everyone. It's been really great. Uh really great being here virtually. And I guess if you're watching this at NeurIPS, we're going to have a question and answer session uh, either ongoing right now or a little bit later. But we'll be, we, you can answer, ask questions uh, and tr try to get more information about what's really going on here and what are the, the cool directions to think about. Yeah, thanks for your attention. And be sure to check out those uh, notes um, for more details. And you know, go try out these implicit layers. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.